but there's something prepared just for you downstairs for Children's Church. I'll get the question out of the way first. How many of you read at least once this week? Be honest. The book of Colossians. Four little chapters. Show me again. Show me again. Hold them up. The other people are super guilty right now. I mentioned... I mentioned in the uh, first hour, <clears throat> this is really an important message. This is kind of, I, I think this is kind of the, the heart. And I'll put in perspective in just a moment here the context of this. You'll see why I'm saying this, but the title of this message today, I've already done the question, is how to win against sin. And I can promise you this will be a two-part message. We've got the communion service. I don't want to I don't want to rush that. But I also I'm I'm just asking you I I I'm, I'm going to try to do my part by God with God's help, but I need you from the youngest person in this room to the oldest person. This applies to all of us. These truths today are <coughs> That, that they are what that says, that title says. This is the how-to. How to, how to win against sin. How to have victory over the flesh. How to change. Really, how to change to the glory of God. And if you think that you don't have any temptation to sin anymore, that's funny. Because <laughs> we all do. In the first part of this verse, if you've turned it there in your Bibles, and we're going to deal with this text, so you might as well get your Bibles open to Colossians chapter 3. So this is the midway point in the book. Verses 1 through 4. This talks about, in verse 3, it'll make the statement that you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in, in God. That we've died to sin. The Bible, this is not the only place. Romans talks about this in a big way in chapters 6, 7. That we, when Christ died, we were identified in his death. Now, that's a pretty, pretty neat thing. His death was the most horrendous death that there ever was, not just from a physical standpoint, but part of that fulfillment of that Passover offering is that the weight of the sin of the world, of every single sin that was ever committed, was placed on him. And that's why the father had to turn his back on him. And Jesus cried out in agony, my God, my God, why, is you, why have you forsaken me? That, that was, that was the real suffering. So his death and how difficult it was. But when we talk about in this passage, that God says that we who trust Christ, part of what that means is we were identified where it counts in that death. That's easy compared to his death in that. So this is a, a key thing that we're going to really be dealing with. There's a classic cartoon by a person by the name of Mary Chambers where two couples are studying the Bible. And one of the women says, well, I haven't actually died to sin, but I did feel kind of faint once. <laughs> So when the Bible says that we're dead to sin, this is the issue. Do you feel it? How do you know it? Is there some sort of a sensation that goes along with this fact, this truth that God says happens when you trusted Christ and when you, had, when you trusted in his death, 
was for you and his resurrection was for you and his ever living now is for you. Is there some sort of a sensation? Is there some sort of a feeling, you know, that you get with that? The answer is no. And that's why you need to listen. And that's why you need to put your confidence. This, this information that we are looking at in this portion, this is in the Bible, which we call God's word, because it is. There is no other place where you get this kind of truth. And when our lives are, are, are centered on this truth, it's eternally significant. Eternally significant, which means right now it makes a huge difference. Huge difference in what kind of a person you are, what kind of a father or husband, what kind of a wife or mother, what kind of a teenager or, ch or child, what kind of a student, what kind of a neighbor. This information makes a radical difference for us. Not every message in every part of the Bible can I just so comfortably and confidently say, oh, this applies to all of us. There's some things that really are more you know, more targeted to a particular thing. Later on, we're going to be talking in this book, we're going to be talking, he gets down in chapter three. <clears throat> He's going to talk about how this applies to the home. He's going to say, here's what, here's what makes, you know, how, how this should change what kind of a husband you are, what kind of a wife you are, what kind of a mother or father you are, and so forth. But it's the foundation is this text. These, these four verses right here. Have I got you? You ready to hear it? So the question that we want to answer. How? How do I win against sin? And these verses are going to talk about this again and again. He said some things in chapter 2 we'll refer to in a moment. <coughs> but he says he makes the statement that we died with Christ. Now he's going to add the corresponding truth that we have been raised up with Christ. And then he gives in verse, in verse 1 and 2, he says, keep seeking things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. Well, how do you do that? <clears throat> There's some people that say, well, I've known some people that are so heavenly minded that they're of no earthly good. But this particular portion of scripture is saying, be to be more good on earth that we need to be more heavenly minded, doesn't it? Then it sort of put it that way. Going back to chapter 2. Well, let me read it. Let's read it. Well, I'm reading from the New American Standard 95, 1995 edition. It's not that it's the only one, but it costs a lot of money to keep up with these updates and stuff. So this is, and it's a good one. This is, this is still very, very good translation from the Greek text. It says, therefore, if you have been raised, or if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. Here's a reason. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Now, when Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. This, these four verses, we're going to take apart today and next week, Lord willing, and give you some real practical things on how to, to grow, how to win against sin, how to become more godly, how to, how to change Becoming more like Christ. Now, in the previous place, we looked at, in preparation for this, the context in chapter 2 is that Paul is attacking and not tolerating those that were trying to, to have a rule-based Christian walk. Legalism, it was called. That the way 
to, to, to be superior Christian is to come up with a set of rules that you, that's what you focus on is keeping all these rules. And we talked about that. I'm not going to go back into that, but it's online. You can go back. If you tend to think that you might have that tendency, you might want to go back and look at that. Then, the, then we looked at another thing that was kind of similar, but it was not so much rules as self-imposed, sacrificial things that you kept, you put your body through, you, you prevented yourself from enjoying, things that God, that God n- did not necessarily say that you shouldn't do. <clears throat> this we defined as asceticism. The false teachers were promoting that idea, this down through the ages, and still today in parts of the world, is the idea some people have that you are more devoted to God if you put yourself through some very rigorous limitations in your, in your Christian life. Both of those things were said, this phrase was the conclusion, that they are of, quote, no value against fleshly indulgence. You can fast if you want, but you're still going to have, the flesh is still going to be there. You're still going to, well, I, I, I know that whenever I have gone on a, a diet or have gone on a fast, food smells even better. <laughs> Just saying pie in my mouth starts to water. (laughs) Now, that's before our text. The verses immediately following our text today, verses 5 through 9, God, through his apostle Paul, tells us to put to death the members of our body. And then he lists these sins that are characterizing the old way of life. And he mentions them. In uh, the next section of verses, he talks about the qualities that those who have been chosen by God should practice. He applies these qualities to how Christian wives and husbands would would live, how children and parents would would interact, how those in the workplace, workers and their bosses should relate to one another. Very, very practical. Again, the foundation for all of that to come is this portion. And I'm afraid what often happens in our teaching plan in our messages and in our Sunday school lessons and in our Bible studies <clears throat> is that we focus on those on those in, in Ephesians it's the parallel passage to this we focus on the here's what kind of husband you should be here's what kind of wife you should be here's what kind of whatever but the basis of it of how to do it is what we're going to look at now big big difference Later on in chapter 4, it closes the the church. He exhorts the church to pray and to be the kind of witness in the world. There there is a personal section since Paul had never actually been to this church. He knew some people in the church because he had taught them in Ephesus. Ephesus or when he had in previous missionary travels in that region. But everything he's hearing about the challenges and the false teaching and the, the, the dangers that were going on in the church, he's getting it from a dear friend that he had led to the Lord who had been trained in the Bible and, and uh, was back there pastoring this church. So there is a personal section in the end of the book and. Chapter 4, verses 7 through 8. But our text, back to this, our text today is the key in two ways. Both to avoiding the sins of the flesh and practicing godly relationships in the church, the home, the workplace, and the rest of the world. So, let's get into it. The questions, how do you become... How do we become more holy and godly? This, these are the same questions from chapter 2 when we were looking at how not to do it. How do we gain victory over the sinful desires of the flesh? It's not through legalism. It's not through asceticism. Now we're going to find out how we do this. How do we gain that victory? Now these verses, <clears throat> if you have your bulletin on the back, you'll notice that there's 1, 2, and 3. And I, I want you to come back. 
I don't know how far we'll get. My wife will roll her eyes if I try to say where, where we're going to get to because she knows better. <laughs> but um, there are three key truths. So I, whatever you do right now, kind of kind of clear out your mind for, and th have three places that you need these truths to be put. These things are each one of these. You don't want to neglect a single one of them. You don't want to diminish one, one of them at all. And so we're going to look at these three truths in order. First of all, number one, as Christians, we need to come to grips with the reality. Simple truth for some. Some people actually stumble over the, the simplicity of this. We all battle the sins of the flesh. Let me emphasize that. If you're of the misguided notion that there are some Christians, you know, that maybe have been Christians a long time, or they are leadership in the church, or, you know, from what you can see, every time you get a glimpse of them, they, they just seem like they really got it all together. Listen, I said all Christians struggle with sins of the flesh. It's an important thing. To, it's really kind of establishing the need step in this passage. Every so often, you'll hear a person, and they are dead serious. You'll hear some believer that claims that he lives above all temptation and sin. That he's learned the secret of victory, and he now abides in Christ. And he never, sin is really never a problem anymore. Tell you what you do, don't argue with him. Because all you're doing if he argues... Is he sinning? And that kind of defeats the... But just talk with his wife. <laughs> or, or their kids. I didn't use women as an example because I, that's foolishness on my part. But <laughs> <clears throat> Just talk to the people that are around him, you know, day in, day out. You'll hear a different story. So, would you, where you're sitting there right now on that nice padded blue seat, would you just admit in yourself, that's me. I, you're saying this as well as me, I struggle daily in this battle. Paul calls them in verse 2 when he says not to think on the things that are on the earth. And in verse 5 later on, when he says, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to, and he lists some things. What we're talking about is these activities that are, that are sinful, sinful things. And he mentions them. In chapter 3, verse 5, down in verse 8 and 9, he lists them. Some you may yet struggle with more than others. Immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed. And he goes on and says anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive speech, and lying. There you go. Now let me just... This is obvious, but God would not have told us to not have our minds characterized on these sins and to put them to death if they were no longer a problem, right? Yeah, he just wouldn't have said that. <clears throat> so, back to our question. If we admit that this is us, that we all battle with these kinds of things, and that we fight against these sins, then again, how? How do we win this battle? All right. So, number two. Number one was the quickest. It gets more involved. Number two, to win this battle against sin, we must understand some things. We must understand, first of all, our new identity in Christ. 
Now, these verses, in these, just these four verses, if you scan back over them, and you, um, some people don't write in their Bible. Some people like to, uh, I, I don't like, per, I'm, I'm not saying you shouldn't, but I don't personally like to mark in my Bible because the next time I come to this passage, I don't want my eye to be prejudiced. I want to read it unbiased. I want to let new things pop out. So I use digital things. I'll cut and paste this into a sheet of paper, and then I'll start doing my observations, and I can scribble all over that because it's just a sheet of paper. But in the first four verses, if you were to look at that, you will find that the word, the name of Christ is mentioned four times. This, this is a, um, a Christ-centered portion of Scripture. It starts to give us a clue as to the, the answering the how to win this battle. It, it's going to have to do with Christ. In other words, Christ is the key to forgiveness Christ is also the key to moment-by-moment Christian living. And the, the, the minute, the second that an individual takes their... Just like Peter trying to walk on the water, what happened when he took his eyes off the Lord? He became the first Baptist. <laughs> so, Christ is, Christ is going to be the key... But there's two things, there's two sides to our identity in thinking about Christ that are, that are vital here. The first one is that we died with Christ. And as I said just a moment ago, listen, this is a, this is a very clearly stated truth in God's Word. But let me just remind you, that his death was a lot harder than you dying with him. His death was immeasurably, indescribably difficult. I, I really don't believe that there's any way to comprehend. Some people put the emphasis upon the physical parts, which I'm not underestimating. Having those long thorns woven into a crown and forced down onto your sensitive skull. Having the preparation ahead of time with your, your beard ripped out, not cut off, but ripped off. The, the lashes on your back that are now pinned up against a rough, splinter-ridden cross. Nails driven through your wrist that when you, the cross sunk down into the socket, ripped it back up to here. The, more, the, the Romans learned that if they put the nails here, that hand would fall away often whenever it, it hit the bottom of the socket of the, in the rock. And so it went ripped up to there. The nail, when the feet were placed over each other and the spike driven through one and then the other and into the wood... I'm not underestimating that, but some people's thoughts about the death of Christ only focus upon the physical aspects of his torment. And the Bible says there was so much more. I, don't, I really don't... We can't identify. The Bible describes the, the nature of the sweetness and the eternal communion between the, the Godhead a doctrine that really nobody understands, but the Bible clearly states over and over. The Son has always existed. He's, he is the eternal God, the Son. And in this eternal existence, He has always had, and I'm going to use a word, perfect union, communion, harmony relationship with the other two members of the Godhead. They, God is essentially a relational God. It's when we're made in His image, that's why we're relational people. And there had never, ever been anything because of their holiness that had disrupted, even for a moment, the union between those in the Godhead. Because sin now is transferred 
As Isaiah 53 says, he was crushed for our iniquities, right? And as your sin, my sin, was willingly and forcefully put on him, and the prophet Isaiah says it crushed him. The Father, for the first time, breaks fellowship, pulls away. One of the things that illustrated that, something like that catastrophic, catastrophic event had happened, was that there was, this week, did any of you travel over to where the eclipse was more complete? I didn't see anybody walking in this way that you had really looked at it the wrong way. I don't know if that was an eclipse, but I do know that when the text says that, that that part of the world went dark in the middle of the day, it was at the same time when God was turning his back on the sin, the sin on, that was crushing his son and crying out in agony. He said, why have you forsaken me? The answer to that question is, is known. It was sin. It was my sin, your sin. <clears throat> this, by the way, when we died with Christ, this is, and I don't know how much people really totally get this. Let me just see by a show of hands, how many of you have ever witnessed a person confessing their faith in Christ by the waters of baptism. You've seen them be put under the water. Hopefully come up again. <laughs> the reason that this, and, and we, we really believe that it's not a sprinkling thing. It's, it, the picture is not complete until the person is put under. The word baptism is the Greek word to dip or immerse. And the picture here is that it pictures this truth we're talking about, that a believer, the moment they trust Christ, the moment they see that his death was for them, that their sin is only forgiven and they're only reconciled because they, they recognize the absolute value of the death of Christ for their sin, not just the world in general, it gets personal, for their sin is this identification. And so the baptism picture is saying to the world, when you're standing there in the water, okay, this is me before I was, before I trusted Christ. But the picture is, as I am put under the water that flashes over me momentarily, and I come out again, I'm, I'm telling you, that was me. I was with Christ. I was in Christ when he died. I was put into the grave. I was on the cross with Christ. And then, I don't wait three days for the pastor to lift me out. <laughs> that would kind of diminish the population of the church. But I raised up, praise God, when he conquered death. That was me that benefited from that. I conquered death because I was in him. And I'm telling this world, I'm not ashamed to be identified with Christ because he was identified with me in my sin, in my need. We died with Christ. He says, you have died. I'll give you some passages. You, I'm not going to read them all. But this is not the only place in the Bible where this particular truth of our identification in his death is mentioned. In Romans 6, verses 3 through 11, it talks about the word baptism, but it's a very strong passage. Romans 6, verses 3 through 11. Romans 7, verse 4, talks about it, and verse 6 of, of Romans 7. Galatians 2, verses 19 and 20. Galatians 6, verse 14. Those all talk about this truth, identification in the death of Christ.
The problem with this truth is that you don't feel dead towards sin. I don't. Even though I know it, the Bible says it, I, my body still resonates with the sins of the flesh. I don't feel dead towards sin or to the world. And, and to tell you the truth, I'm tempted to sin. And my old nature feels very much alive, even though I just said that I died with Christ. There's a strong, there's a strong desire inside to, to sin. So what does it mean? What does it mean that I am dead to sin in Christ? And how can this truth that is stated in the perfect eternal word of God help me to overcome sin? Now, you, you staying with me? Now, you, you left me a long time ago if when I went to the first point and I said, everybody here is sinful. If, if you were secretly saying, not me. Your pride just was a sin. Anyway, the answer is, I want you to understand. Let's focus on this word, and we're probably just going to get only this far. But this is a key, key thing. I'm going to give it to you, and then I'm going to uh, illustrate it, and then we're going to pause for the Lord's Supper. In the Bible... The, the concept of death, the term death in the Bible, the way the Bible uses that term, it never means termination of existence. Never means that. It, never, it, it, it means rather separation. Okay? The, the Bible concept of death, Old Testament, New Testament, the concept of death is the idea of separating. So if you're talking about if a person, you know, we just got word that a dear, dear lady that started a ministry in Southern California, I went there many times to help them. Her name was Muriel Hersom. Muriel never was married, but she had a, a complete burden for those who were deaf and blind. She started a ministry called Commission on Compassion, and she would take in people that were usually very abused people that could not see at all and could not hear at all, and their world was just at the end of their fingertips. That was it. And the Lord blessed Muriel with the with entrusted her with funds and they built an apartments that these people could come in and they designed them. The doorbells were fans that would come on if you hit the doorbell. So people, they could tell, oh, somebody's at my door. The kitchens were specially designed. When I worked at the headquarters, we had new cabinets put in, but it was all with, how, with what their needs were. She just stepped into the presence of the Lord. And I'm telling you what, when that gal stepped into the Lord's presence, there was a party. But separation is what death is. Separation from our physical bodies, when the soul and the spirit separate from that, that's, that's why it's death. <clears throat> but to be identified with Christ in his death, here's the separation truth of that. It means that you were separated from the power of the flesh and from the evil world, the, the grip that you only, that there, it was exclusive control and power over you, and that the mo there was a separation from that world system and from Satan's power over you, and now you're a citizen of a new country of heaven. You do not have to obey. When you become, when you change citizenship, you do not have to, you've lost the connection of whatever regulations and, and laws were in that country, you're now under a new set of rules and laws. I gave you that illustration last week of the man who had been a citizen of a foreign country, and in that extremely rigid foreign country, that he had grown up with a 6 o'clock p.m. curfew. And when he became a citizen of the United States, 
And it, when all of a sudden he realized one day that it was six o'clock and he was not near his home to get home inside his front door, he was panicking until somebody said, sir, you're no longer under that curfew. We don't have that curfew here. You died to that law. You're separated from that. So the power is no longer over you on that, in that respect. Please open your Bible to turn over to Romans chapter 6, verse 11. Romans 6.11, as I mentioned just a moment ago, this passage of Romans 6 is all about this identification thing. It talks, it uses the word baptism, but you, you read it, it's really not baptism in water, it was, it was an identification thing. And when we get to verse 11, it's kind of a conclusion in an argument after a bunch of presentation of truth. And it starts with the words, even so. So it's kind of, okay, what does this all mean for me? So here's what verse 11 says. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let me read it. <clears throat> Grammatically, it could be read this way. Even so, first, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but also consider yourselves to be alive to God in Christ Jesus. What's the responsibility, what's the word in that verse that I added twice that is your and my responsibility? Consider. That Greek word says, don't just give some thought to it. This is either believed, understood, and believed and counted on, or it's not. And that's what our passage is saying in Colossians. Consider this. Consider yourselves to be dead to sin. It is not, beloved, a matter of feeling dead to sin, but it is actually a legal truth fact. So if you're joined to Christ by faith, you're one with him in his death. And that separated you from the old life, which was a tyrant keeping us in sin. And now you're married to a whole new husband, which gives you new life and freedom from sin. Now, what you need to come back for next time is the second truth about identification with where Christ is now. And there is some cool stuff in this that I can't wait to give you. But let's, let's stop there. Let's put this away until next time. And I, I'm going to ask Pam to come up to the piano and I've talked with four gentlemen leaders in the church if you would just come forward and there's some chairs over here in the front while while Pam's playing a little bit of music it would it would be a good thing for us in preparation for for taking obeying the Lord as in this communion you might, this might be, you might be a visitor here and you say, what about me? Well, if you've trusted Christ and you can, you can appreciate and, and worship the Lord in obeying him when he said, this do in remembrance of me. If you can understand this does not save you and forgive your sins, this swells your heart in gratitude for what he has already done for you. You are so welcome to partake of this. I do want to give you a warning that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where it talks about doing this sort of thing, there is a warning for people that do, do it for the wrong reasons or do it without thinking. Don't do, I would advise you not to do that. That's a mockery to the Lord.